Hello and welcome uh, to this meeting of the Jersey City Free Public Libraries uh, program, Olympians in the Community. Uh, thanks for joining us here today to all our guests and thanks to my colleague Yolanda for putting this program together. Uh, my name is John Beekman. I'm the manager of the New Jersey Room here at the Jersey City Free Public Library. And we are joined here today with uh, th three Olympians and, and two folks who have close connections to Olympians from Jersey City uh, and Jim Haig, sports writer, who's going to moderate the program. Uh, we're joined by Otis Davis, who has a double gold medal winner at the Rome Olympics 1960. First man to break the coveted 45 second barrier in the 400 meters and he anchored the four by 400 meter relay team to victory with both events in world record time. Mr. Davis has worked with children in Jersey City and beyond for many years, has received many awards and honors throughout his life and has traveled the world extensively. Uh, Mr. Davis holds a BS in health and physical education from the University of Oregon. And uh, Gail Marquise, who is a 1976 USA Olympic champion, uh, earned in place in history as a member of the first USA women's Olympic basketball team. She and her teammates earned a silver medal and was the first time that women competed in basketball at the Olympic Games. Uh, she currently serves as a director of development for the William J. Maxwell College of Arts and Sciences at NJCU here in Jersey City. Uh, she brings a wealth of knowledge and access to the community, the background in finance and investment banking, having worked at several investment banks and financial institutions. She really uh, received her BA in secondary education and psychology from Queens College and her MBA in business administration from the University of Phoenix. Um, we also have Elena Pierskova who competed with the women's wrestling team in the 2012 and 2016 Olympics. And she won silver and bronze medals at the World Championship. She is the first female wrestling coach at NJCU. And uh, Ms. Pierskova has just graduated with her doctorate in chiropractic medicine. Congratulations on that. Uh, we are also joined by uh, Charles, Charles Mays Jr son of the late 1968 track and field Olympian, Charlie Mays, uh, who followed in his father's footsteps and attended the University of Maryland Eastern Shore on a track scholarship. He's been the head coach of the men's and women's cross country program at NJCU. He's coached at the high school level and for community organizations. He holds a bachelor's of science degree in business administration and a master's in management from Walden University. And finally, uh, Alan Delosier, who is a university archivist at Seton Hall University, who uh, is coming to share information about the late Andrew Andy Stanfield, uh, who is an outstanding ath athlete at the university where he's earned several national titles. Um, and he went on to win two gold medals in the 1952 Olympics and a silver medal in 1956. Um, and both uh, Andy and Charlie Mays were graduates of Lincoln High School here in Jersey City. And so to talk with this esteemed panel is our local esteemed sports writer, Jim Haig, a veteran sports writer here in Northern New Jersey, who joined me uh, several weeks ago uh, to talk about Jackie Robinson's first at bat here uh, at Roosevelt Stadium. He's covered all manner of games in several newspaper venues throughout the city and county. Uh, I won't go on to that here so we can get into our program, but I really appreciate Chip you coming out to join us again to, uh, to lead a panel discussion uh, on Olympians in the community. And with that, I'll turn it over to you, Jim. Thank you, John. And thank you very much to our, uh, our great panel that's here today. And I've been very fortunate with the only person that I never interviewed before is Alan, but I did get to interview um, Andy Stanfield in his career and Charlie Mays Sr. in his career. And then also I got to know uh, everybody else that's on the panel. So especially some even more better than others, uh, like people like uh, Gail, who um, was a, a guest on my Hudson County sports podcast recently. 
and Otis, who I've known for a long time when we used to work together at the Jersey City YMCA and for Jersey City Recreation. So it's a great panel, and uh, and we have a lot to be proud of, all, all, all of the members on the panel today. So um, with that in mind, we're going to start by talking about um, the great achievements of Andy Stanfield, who unfortunately we lost um, in 1985, um, but uh, he definitely left his mark as uh, a great, great uh, Olympic athlete, probably one of the greatest athletes to ever come out of Jersey City. And like John mentioned, two-time gold medal winner in the Helsinki Olympics in 1952, and then also was a, a, bronze, a, gold, a, bronze, a silver medal winner in 1956. And uh, Alan Delosier is going to speak a little bit about Andy's uh, achievements. So, Alan, I'm going to turn it over to you. Alan? Great. Thank you so much, Jim. And it's a great pleasure to meet you. And I should say that I have Jersey City roots myself. I worked at St. Peter's for a number of years, and I'm a really big fan of the Peacocks. And anyway, I also want to thank John and Yolanda for the invitation and the generous introduction. And also being in your great company, it's an honor to be here today. And it's also an honor to talk about Andy Stanfield. He was known at one point as the world's fastest human. So I'll take a cue from him and try to summarize his life in a very quick but thorough um, overview. Okay. Andrew Andy William Stanfield was born on December 29th, 1927 in Washington, D.C., and he grew up at 75A Oak Street in Jersey City. Sandfield attended Lincoln High School, as Jim already noted, and uh, John as well, on Crescent Avenue, located in Pavonia. At Lincoln, Stanfield was the city, county, and state champion in the 220-yard dash, the broad jump, and the city and county champ in the 220, 440, broad jump, and pole vault. His city pole vault mark stood for years and his 22 feet, five inch leap in the state broad jump remains to be better at Lincoln High School as of 1952 at least. He achieved all state honors in the 220 and broad jump twice and national indoor championship honors in the 440. Overall, he won the city and county 220, 440, broad jump and pole vault championships three times prior to graduation. He was very accomplished at a young age. Then when Stanfield uh, followed a stint in the Army as a radio repairman during uh, World War II, where he was stationed in the South Pacific. Afterwards, he uh, enrolled at Seton Hall University in 1948, taking advantage of the GI Bill of Rights, which paid for his uh, education. But also, his athletic prowess was much sought after by a number of colleges in the country. And he was coached by the legendary uh, Johnny Gibson, who was there for at least 40 years, who helped to turn Stanfield into an excellent hurdler, and in addition, developed him as a sprinter and long jumper, along with his other natural and uh, proven talents on the track and field. Sandfield began racking up national titles in the spring of 1949, winning the AAU Amateur Athletic Union Championships in the 100 meters and 200 meters. But however, unfortunately, Stanfield was a little bit injury prone, and because of some troublesome uh, nagging um, things that uh, limited his access, to the track in terms of rehab and working forward in terms of um, becoming more healthy. This led him to the 60 yards and 100 meters and the 200 and 220 became his strongest distances at this time period in the late forties. The famous uh, newspaper writer, Arthur Daly, who was sports editor for the New York Times for a number of years, wrote in 1950 about Stanfield. The title of world's fastest human is not hereditary as that of the house of Windsor Undoubtedly, it is safe to take a peek at the current holder of same. He is Andy Stanfield of Seton Hall, who has rocketed from nowhere in little more than a year. With his silken stride, Handy Andy has covered the 100 in 9.4 seconds. His style is what is most, most eye-catching. The Seton Hall youngster is the closest thing yet to the legendary Jesse Owens for beautiful form. He doesn't run, he flows. And those are the words of Arthur Daly. And many others could attest to that too at the time period who saw him in action. The following year, Stanfield won the AAU indoor title in the long jump. In 1952, he was the 200 meters uh, champion at that same um, uh, meet for the AAU. During the college career, he was won eight of a possible four IC4A sprint titles, both indoors and outdoors. There's a lot to talk about, so I'm getting a bit tongue-tied here. But the IC4A championships was an intercollegiate um, meet that was really highly regarded back in the 1940s, 50s, and going forward in time. 
And Stanfield's list of accolades during the era included six AAU titles and nine IC4A titles, both indoors and outdoors overall. Internationally, the 200 meters was Stanfield's strongest distance. In 1951 at the IC4A championships, Stanfield in the outside lane won the turn 220 yard dash in 20.6 seconds. He would equal his performance twice, running 20.6 again in 1952 and 56 at that same meet title. Now, during the pre-Olympics and during the early 1950s, Stanfield was a stalwart at Seton Hall's um, cross-country and track teams. He was also a member of the Alpha Phi Alpha fraternity off the track. He was very involved in terms of academics, along with athletics, as a physical education major. And after graduating from the school in 1952, as a world record holder, Stanfield was not a surprise winner of the gold medal at the 1952 Helsinki Summer Olympics, equaling the Olympic record in the final. As a member of the American 4x100 relay team, Stanfield won a second Olympic gold medal. And after the Olympiad, Stanfield ran for the Pioneer Athletic Club of New York City. By 1953, Stanfield became director of intramural athletics at Seton Hall and also was named the Goodwill Ambassador for Shenley Industries. And if you're not familiar with Shenley Industries, they did a lot with whiskey and so forth. So um, during the mid 1950s, Stanfield returned to Jersey City and joined the Board of Education as a physical education teacher at public school number 39 and was a YMCA coordinator at day camps during summer vacation. He later became athletic coordinator for public schools throughout Jersey City during the mid 1950s. During the 1956 Melbourne Olympics, Stanfield won a silver medal in the 200 meters. And after that, by 1957, the following year, Stanfield retired from competitive running and was fitted at, event, at an event at the Hotel Plaza in New York City to sort of put a capstone on his remarkable running career. However, this wasn't the end of Andy Stanfield in terms of his wonderful accomplishments. During the 1950s and 60s, Stanfield carved out a career in the computer business. And he also started at Schaefer Beer as a public relations and marketing expert. Um, among his initiatives was being a producer of fashion shows at the Apollo Theater in New York and other venues, including the show of stars for clothing designers in the area. In addition, during the mid-1960s, Stanfield was an announcer analyst for televised track meets on a television station, WPIX in uh, New York. <laughs> and basically he had his own show on Sunday afternoons called the Schaefer Circle of Sports. And otherwise, as one newspaper of the time noted, when Schaefer's top image builder, the smooth as silk, Andy Stanfield, isn't winning on Bermuda tennis courts, influencing people to ask for the brew when visiting the States. So he was very visible in the community doing a lot of great uh, marketing and PR, but also in terms of doing other types of um, really meaningful things, such as in 1966, the United Block Association at their first annual indoor track festival named their team trophy after Andy Stanfield for um, team excellence in this particular meet. And he also headed a computer science school in Jersey City uh, around this time. Mm -hmm. And by 1967, Stanfield considered running for political office, but he was considered too nice and too um, focused on all these wonderful initiatives outside of the political realm that he ended up not running for um, elected uh, position. And by 1968, Stanfield became president of a company called CompuTrain, a computer training school which really dealt with a lot of um, Newark and urban New Jersey areas. And he formed People Systems Inc., an, outfield, uh, an outfit of the development group, which had purposes that developed African-American businesses in the area. And later, Stanfield became director of the Greater Newark Chamber of Commerce, and executive vice president of People's Development Corporation, and became an advisor to the New, New Jersey Board of Distributive Education. And it's interesting, in 1969, Stanfield and his family, uh, the former Gloria Bolden of Jersey City, um, they had two children, Karen and Billy. They were featured in a wonderful local and national Coca-Cola campaign. And as John said, pictures are forthcoming, not only on this, but other types of um, items that relate to Stanfield's career. And during the 1970s, Stanfield was still competitive. He participated in various master's level track events and he belonged to the Grand Street Boys, and the athletic, um, Shore Athletic Club during his time after his intercollegiate athletic uh, career came to an end. Otherwise, just wrapping up uh, his life in a, in a brief way, in 1973, Stanfield was appointed by the White House 
to the Office of Economic Opportunity. Uh, this was dealing with um, the drug abuse problem in the country and his expertise in terms of working with the community really benefited this organization. And he became a chief executive officer for Olympic type um, <clears throat> organization in New York City prior to being elected to the uh, National Track and Field Hall of Fame. And as uh, Jim mentioned, unfortunately and sadly, uh, he passed away in 1985, but he's not forgotten. And thank you so much for allowing me to talk a little bit about Andy Stanfield and his wonderful, incredible legacy. Oh. That's a lot of things you learn uh, as uh, in, a, in, a, in a forum like this. I had no idea about uh, the Schaefer Circle of Sports, but that's, uh, uh, that's a great, great uh, achievement on Andy's part. And, more, and then the last thing to just to mention is that he was also one of the initial uh, inductees in the Hudson County Sports Hall of Fame when we started that association back in the year 2000. Uh, unfortunately, it was posthumously, but we made sure that Andy was one of the initial members of the Hudson County Sports Hall of Fame. So he was a great, great, uh, great, great athlete. And sure enough, a lot to be proud of to have him from Jersey City. There's no question. So Alan, thank you very much for, for sharing a little bit about Andy. Thank you so much, Jim. Thanks, everybody. No problem. Okay. All right. And then our next, uh, our next speaker is uh, we're, we're gonna we're gonna go uh, maybe a little bit in order. And our next speaker is the illustrious Mr. Otis Davis, who um, it was also a two-time gold medal winner in the Olympics. He won his gold medals in the same Olympics in 1960 um, in uh, Rome. And uh, Otis's story is absolutely one of a kind. Um, and I'm going to allow him to talk about it more because I got to know, I've known Otis for, oh gosh, I'm going to say more than 30 years now. And his story is just absolutely outstanding from going to, uh, from his, from his native, growing up in his days in Alabama to then going to, to the university of Oregon on a basketball scholarship, no less, he was going to play basketball there. And then he somehow gets in a war of words with the immortal, immortal uh, Bill Bowerman, who is probably the most recognized track and field coach in history. And Otis made some sort of comment, I can run faster than that. And sure enough, Bowerman said, well, if I can, if you can, come on over here and try. And sure enough, Otis did. And more importantly, uh, which is a distinction that Otis holds and will never go away, he was the first ever athlete to ever wear uh, Nike sneakers um, in a competitive uh, in a competitive fashion. Uh, Bob Bowerman used to make the sneakers out of uh, tires um, and then put them in his waffle iron, and that was what he used as the sneakers. And the first ever athlete to ever wear the Nike sneakers was none other than Otis Davis. So, with that in mind, I'll now turn it over to Otis. And Otis, thank you very much for joining us today. And it's a pleasure seeing you today. And um, please give us a few minutes about your life. Thank you very much for those final words. Uh, I'm always happy to be involved in programs like this because uh, my background is one, I was, I hate to date myself, but I will, born uh, during segregation in the South. Uh, Tuscaloosa, Alabama, which was not too far from the University of Alabama campus. I grew up uh, thinking about wanting to play for the University of Alabama, but it never happened. Uh, fortunately, I graduated from a Black High School and joined the United States Air Force. And physically, uh, I was very small during that time, but as when I joined the Air Force, I got stronger and I grew up about three or four inches and uh, the, the, the people in town did not recognize me when I came back, but that was one of the best things that could happen to me because it gave me a chance to get out in the world and uh, compete against people of all colors and, and from all countries and, and to learn a, a lot about the world. Uh, I had not even thought about track and field. We didn't even have track and field in my, uh, a uh, high school in Alabama. And uh, I just lived and breathed basketball. I played basketball in the United States Air Force. And when I got out, I moved out to California and uh, 
played with Los Angeles City College. We had a good basketball team in the second year. We won 34 games and lost one. And uh, I had thought about going to uh, UCLA, but I didn't have enough credits at the time to go. And all, although they were recruiting me, so uh, in the meantime, uh, one of my teammates at, at uh, Los Angeles City College went to the University of Oregon. So I said, okay, uh, I'll send some clippings to them and see what it happens there. And uh, I was recruited and uh, I played a little basketball that first year. The coach uh, did not understand a player like me. I had a lot of natural ability and uh, the students knew about it. He was the only one who didn't know, I guess. But after that first year, I was out, uh, as Jim said, I was watching the runners, cross country runners, and they were running on pace. You know, as a basketball player, they had to be running fast as far as I was concerned. And I, I said, oh, I can beat, this is what I said to myself, I said, I can beat those guys. So I went out to see Coach Barman and I said, uh, look, I'd like to, join your, your track team. He said, yeah. He says, what do you do? I said, what do you need? <laughs> and he said, high jumpers, because he'd seen me jumping, I guess, on the basketball court. So uh, he had me try out these different events. And uh, first I was in, in, entered in the high jump and I tied for third uh, against Washington State. Uh, just like terrible for him, jumping over the fence. <laughs> and, and he started trying me in the long jump and uh, they call it broad jump, but it's a long jump. And I went from one event to another. Everybody was saying, stay away from my event because they saw I had some natural ability. But he told me after where I ran a fast 100 yard dash, he brought the sprinters from the University of Oregon team in and he had me run against them. They got down in the starting blocks and I'd never been in starting blocks before. So I just got down like they did. They took off. but. I almost caught them at the end, and he got so excited about it. He said, I got another event for you. I said, what? He said, the 220. I said, oh, boy. I said, he's stretching this out a little bit. I never thought about the 440 at all. After I had some good success in the, in the uh, 220, he said, I got something else for you. I said, oh, here we go again. So <laughs> the next time he said, the 440, I said, wait a minute, I'm not a math major. I said, but if I've been going with 220 halfway around there, you say 440, that's all the way around. I said, and I didn't come out here to get tired. I just came out to have a little fun. <laughs> I, I had good success in it. And uh, the next year or two, I uh, made the Olympic team. I barely made it. I finished third in the trials. I was still learning how to run. I thought I couldn't run uh, uh, in the semis in the final. And, and uh, I said, I think I can do better in this. So I got, I was learning how to run, if you can imagine that, in the pre-Olympic heats. And I had, they put me in the middle against, uh, and I'd have the other runners around me. And I did, I just keyed off of them. When they got tired, I just kept running. I don't want to simplify it, but that's the way it was. Uh, fortunately, I ran against some real good, good runners. Uh, and I, I made the Olympic team and I, I won. I ran against a very talented, undefeated German runner. They didn't tell me I, he was undefeated until afterwards. I was glad of that. But anyway, uh, the rest was history. I, we broke a barrier and won two gold medals. And I did try a pair of those shoes out. My, my coach uh, asked me to try a pair of the shoes. They look strange. And I said, what, 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 what? Shoes, they look so light. I said, I hope I don't turn a, a, a spike in it because I was running the anchor. And, you know, I, they were depending on me. But, hey, I said, boy, these are pretty good shoes. So they were the, the, the uh, Nike shoes. I didn't get the credit for it at first. Nope. But my, my uh, publication coming out will tell the true story of the whole thing. I'm not as concerned about that now. But anyway, uh, I did have get a chance to run against some fi fine competitors. And uh, I will say one thing about, I, I ran against uh, a, a very a great competitor. His name was Charlie Mays. He was, uh, I saw, I looked in the book after I'd won and, and 
they had one of my competitors was going to win the next, he's going to be the next champion. I said, wait a minute. And I was defending champion. So I said, Hey, I want to make a, I want to uh, make a comeback. I want to run in the nationals again. Coach says, have you been working out? Coach Barnes. I said, no, but I'm going to start. So I started working out, just ran a few minutes to get tired. And like I say, there were some outstanding runners in there. I have the program I brought with me. Uh, uh, Charlie Mays Jr. can look at it if he wants. He's in the program, a great runner. Uh, Charlie Mays, he went to Maryland State. I, I saw it on the program. Outstanding. I think, and I'll tell you right now, I think he would have been a great decathlete because he was good in a lot of good events. Uh, I stopped at the 440 because I did good enough. But I'm sure when I found out he did so good in so many events, I mean, Charlie Mays, I said, boy, he could have been a good decathlete, you know. But anyway, he still made his mark. And I, 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 I say, I fortunately won that championship again the next year. And I retired now and I came back and I've been working in Jersey City and at Union City. And some of the events that I have, I, I pride myself as being an innovative director because we have games that children get involved in. I said, uh, I, one of the games was uh, whistle stops. I told you, I said, I want you to start and stop on the whistle. And these are the kids in Jersey City and Union City. I said, you don't start or you don't stop until I blow the whistle. I said, okay. So I blew the whistle and they started. I blew the whistle again and they stopped. So I started, made a little game of that. I said, okay, go ahead. And some of them hey, didn't think about it. I told them, you can't start. You got to start and stop on the whistle. So that was a little game we had. And I like to have innovative events like that. Two things, they were conditioned to responding when I blew the whistle and they were starting and stopping, which is one of the aspects of in sports. You have to be able to start and stop. So they were learning and they had a lot of fun. And I'm just glad uh, I'm a part of this panel and I, I'm just, thank you for giving me the time to explain some things. I have a, a book coming out soon I have a lady friend of mine, she's putting on a computer and it's some interesting material in there. And uh, thank you for sharing this with me. Thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate it, Otis. It's great talking to you. All right, really, if you if you don't mind, well, we'll you know what, we'll, we will let everybody speak and then we'll turn it over to questions later on, okay? So Otis, thank you very much for, for, for giving your okay. story, okay? And uh, our next speaker, I'm going to ask, will be Charlie Mays Jr. He'll speak on behalf of his father, who was a two-time Olympian, uh, 64 in the 68 Olympics, um, and is considered to be one of the also, just like Andy Stanfield, one of the greatest athletes to ever come out of Jersey City. Um, and um, Charlie Mays Sr. had uh, also, not only did he have a great athletic career, but he had a great career in serving the community and became an elected official. And he did a lot um, for helping the kids of Jersey City for many, many years. And we're very, very blessed to have his son here to speak about his father's achievements in both the 64 and the 68 Olympics. And as everybody knows, the 68 Olympics was a very, very controversial Olympics. That was the one that was in Mexico City. So I'm gonna let uh, Charlie Mays Jr. speak a little bit about his father. Charlie, how are you today? All right, great. Thank you. Thank you for everyone. Just for let me. This is my first time actually talking about my dad. Um, it's uh, Mr. Davis. I didn't know that story. Um, my <laughs> father, my father kept a lot of that stuff, I guess, uh, quiet because he didn't like to really talk about himself much yeah. at all. So, but he was born in um, February fourth, February third, nineteen forty-one. He's grew up in Booker T. Washington projects. Funny thing about it, everybody thinks he's just this great track guy, and it just Track was a default. He was actually a, a great baseball player. Now, um, yeah, he, uh, at 16, uh, now 15 or 16, the Brooklyn Dodgers came to see him. So when he went to try out for the, for the baseball team at Lincoln High School, they told him he was too short. He stopped playing. He was just so offended that everybody knew about him. The Brooklyn Dodgers came to see him. My grandfather said, no, he's getting his education. So coming from the, the projects, you know, had an opportunity to make a little bit of money. He had 11 brothers and sisters. They all lived down there. 
So he gave up, he just gave up baseball. No. So he went to track and field. And um, the first year he ran, um, his coach was Bill Payne, Mr. Payne. And um, in the state meet, he won six events. He had six titles in one meet. He won the long jump, the triple jump, the high jump, the 100, the 200, and the 400. He didn't run the relays because he was too tired. So he, my father was, a, he was a great athlete, but like, again, I said, I never, he never, we never pushed it on me or any, anybody else. But after Lincoln, uh, he graduated uh, in, it was, you can graduate in the winter at that time. So he graduated winter of 59. The next day he was on a bus to Maryland State and uh, his coach at Maryland State, coincidentally, is, is uh, Cappy Anderson. Now, Cappy Anderson is his son plays for the, uh, I think it's the Memphis Grizzlies or, or Dallas, mm-hmm. Kyle Anderson. That's his grandfather. Yeah. So that was his coach in college. So when he got off the bus, he, um, he never really, you know, you knew about segregation. So he told me the story of when he got off the bus, he went automatically to a diner to get something to eat because he was hungry. So he's sitting at the, the counter. He hears a click, click, turns around. There's a gun in his face. He said, boy, I know you're from up here, but I think you better go back down to, but down to your campus and stay there. So that was just kind of his awakening to what's going on in the world. So at Maryland State, I didn't mean to jump off subject, but at Maryland State, he's done a lot of things. Uh, he has two national titles. 400, no, in the long jump, the mile relay. Coincidentally, when Mr. Davis said, uh, my father was like, again, uh, he took stuff as the fall. The long jump was easier for him. He could run the 400 in 44 seconds, 44, 44 high, but he was a 500 meter, 500 yard runner. He would hold the world record for 56 minutes, 56 seconds, 0.7 in the 500 meters. But that only lasted like uh, maybe, <laughs> A month or two because I think believe either Lee Evans or uh, Larry, Larry James broke that record from Villanova. So he graduates. He graduated from Maryland State uh, with a mathematics degree. Then, as when he graduated, he ran for the Grand Street Boys. Well, with the Grand Street Boys, he was on the circuit in 1964. He did not make the 1964 team. Actually, he got injured during the trials. He pulled his hamstring, so he did not make the 1960, looked in 1964 team. He would probably did, excuse me? I said, my apologies. I thought no, 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 that's fine. No, 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 that's fine. That's, no, it's fine. But the thing is, um, it, you know, it really drove him to make a difference as far as uh, really take training and stretching seriously. That he told me himself is like, I, I would just go sit, sit around, run, you know, you know, relax, run again, and never really take the traditional aspect and calisthenic accident really, really serious because that makes a difference. So from 64 on, he, he, uh, he made it his business. Uh, he ran, he ran, he jumped, and uh, he became really a great jumper. So when 68 came around, he made the team. Now, that, was a, that team was loaded, I believe, to me, I no disrespect, Mr. Davis, that was a, probably the best assembled American team there ever will be because there were, there were guys on that team that could do everything. Now, there's a, there's a story that's very true. You can, you can backtrack me, Jim. When they picked the four-by-one team for the 1968 Olympics, there uh, was Jim Hines, uh, Charlie Green, um, Mel Pender and I forgot uh, I forgot the other person. So Tommy Smith, John Carlos, Larry Quist, and my father went to the coach Peyton Jordan and asked them, "Say, look, we could beat them." So they wanted to have a runoff. They would run a four by one three times. So my, it would be my father to John Carlos to Larry Quist to Tommy Smith anchoring. Then you had Jim Hines anchoring the other team and Mel Pender. And Charlie Green won the first two legs. I don't know who the third leg was for that team. They beat them two out of three times. That was my father's in the team. Co- coincidentally, they won the gold medal and broke the world record at the time. But if, uh, if he would have got his way, he would have got his medal. 
So when it came for my father's time to jump at the Olympics, Bob Beeman kind of ruined it for everyone because <laughs> mentally. He did. Because Bob Beeman was, uh, if you look at his track record before the Olympics, he was, just, he was a steady 27, 26 high, 27 jumper. So Bob Beeman is one of the first jumpers. He pops a 29, two and a half. Everybody's mentally shot, done. My father said, I, I couldn't even focus. I said, I couldn't believe it. If you watch the footage of, of the actual jump, you can see my father slapping his leg like, damn, like I can't even do this anymore. So it, it was, it's um, a lot of stories. If some of these Olympians and that exposed me to a lot um, and exposed my, my sister and my brother. And um, it really changed him in a way that it made more conscious of what's gone today's world. So after track and field, when he left, when he finished, he was going to try to go, as Mr. Davis said, for the decathlon in 72. Meanwhile, he had two kids at home. <laughs> he had to make money. He was a, he was a, math, a mathematics teacher for the RCA Institute. Uh, and so he had to make a choice. He was already, he's going on 32, he was be 32 years old in 1972. And he made a choice to give up track, but I, I do believe he would have been a great decathlete from the jump because he could do everything. My father can jump seven feet. He can run 44 and a quarter. He could run a 20, 20 point, uh, whatever in a 200. So he, we, uh, um, after the track and field, he became, like I said, very conscious. If he, in that, he created the Black Athlete Hall of Fame. And um, it was a, a conglomerate of all the, the well-known Black athletes that he made a Hall of Fame to appreciate the ones that are not appreciated on the different levels of, of athletics. So his <laughs> first, like some of the first members of his class was Pele, Jackie Robinson, uh, the Bill Russells. I think he even honored Andy Stanfield. Because Andy right. Stanford was his, he idolized that man. He really, he got, he gives Andy Stanford so much credit for what he was able to do because Andy took him under his wing because they both graduated from Lincoln and he, 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 he can't even, he can't even, he couldn't even really put in the words what he done, he's done for him, but he was the one who guided him. So he always tried to pass it on and, um, do that. So back to back to the Black Athlete Hall of Fame. It it was to this day. It, it's it's a great. It was a great vision that he brought to life. And we I still, we gotten calls about the name because he's the name is copywritten, and it's not a lot of social and justice going on and stuff like that. So there, there's a lot of things that are going on as far as the. Um, the athlete, the, the black athlete, the, the brown athlete, the, the different types of athletes, it could be Asian, anybody. It, it, was a, it needed to be said, to be heard. So it, he created this hall of fame. So when that, when that funding ran out, <laughs> he went on to politics. Uh, he became assemblyman for Jersey City and Bayonne in the 31st district, district for four years. Um, he didn't want to, um, he wanted to use whatever notoriety he had in the city to make change for, for people. And he was a very community-based person. So he did that for four years. He wasn't crazy about it. Um, politics is a, is a game he didn't really like, but he, he wanted to try to make a difference. So after that, it, it basically, he, he's, he would work for the city for the rest of his, his life. Uh, like during the, like eight, in Olympics, uh, when the Olympics came to town or it was like 96 or, or even 84, we will, he would all try to work those Olympics and just try to be involved to see his teammates, just, just to be, always be involved with the Olympic movement. But um, to make a long story short, he, um, he remained in Jersey City. We always, want, you know, my mom wanted to move out of Jersey, period. So that never happened. He loved Jersey City and Jersey that much that we never really left. So. The mark that he's made, um, I hear stories to this day about him. Um, I don't even have a name. I'm Little Charlie, especially when I became a coach. Oh, you Charlie Mason. He goes, okay, fine. But I love it. 
You know, even when I was competing at Maryland, I remember anchoring the four by one team. Here you got Dennis Mitchell on one side and all these other, like all these other guys on the other side. And I'm anchoring the four by one. Who do they announce? Oh, son of Olympian Charlie Mays. You got Chuck Mays anchoring the team. I'm done. So those things, they never really, they bothered me at the time, but I have to appreciate what groundwork he's made for me as far as, as a dad and as a man. But at, for all these other kids who he's come from the projects, had nothing. He tried to make, a, you know, make something for himself and his family because my, my uncle's done things in the city, the very big parts of the city. My uncle was a bishop. I had a other, another uncle was a, who was a Black Panther. I had my other uncle who, who was the financial officer for the city. So it's a lot of us. And, you know, I'm thankful for, for the things he's ch shown me and guided me. He's guided others like Keith Davis and Larry Ross. And he, he used to train them. I mean, they've made marks and he's tried, you, you try to try to keep it moving. So when I became, with all these, these little learning lessons and, and all these other, uh, this, these, these learning, like, learning lessons he's putting in front of me, I just tried to make myself, I got into coaching. Now, Elena, you're at NJCU, which is, if you walk in the gym, you see all those old Americans on the wall, right? That's all track and field, that's all us. And, you know, I'm proud to say that 70% of my success as a coach comes from my father because he never pushed anything on me. He just made it a life lesson in how sports and life can, can correlate to make you propel forward. So I don't want to hold anyone else's time. I'll take any questions. I'm not a great speaker like that, but if you pose me with questions, I'll answer any questions you want to know. But thank you everyone for choosing me just to talk about my dad. It's kind of refreshing. Well, I've, I've called you Charlie Mays Jr. for the longest time. Mind. And you don't, you want to be known as Chuck. I'll call you Chuck from now on. You don't mind? You, you can call me Mays Chuck. It's my name. It's on my birth certificate. It doesn't matter. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, uh, Chuck, Charlie, I appreciate everything you had to say. And, and don't sell yourself short because you did a great job as being a public speaker. And uh, explain to the people that are viewing uh, right now, that's your father's Olympic jacket behind you, isn't it? Oh, yeah. yeah I got. Uh, I can show you. I have his jacket. His opening, his opening ceremonies jacket behind me. There you go. And I have another, wait a minute, there's one more thing. Wait a minute. This is his actual uniform and this is the picture. See that? Right before wow. that, he slaps his leg. That's what I'm talking about. That's his, his uniform. We actually gave this to him on Father's Day. So before he passed, he said, take it, <laughs> put it away. Okay. So, Those are great but, memories. But, um, yeah, I mean, and this is like, like stuff from Maryland State and stuff like that. And this is this, the park. And that's just all other stuff we have going on here. That's great. That's great. I saw that. I saw the jacket. It stood out. And uh, yeah. and he showed that to me a long time ago when I did a story about the uh, the Olympics being in, in Atlanta. And I got a chance, a good chance to sit down and talk to dad about his experiences uh, of being an Olympian. And uh, well, I'm going to get back to you and ask you the questions that I have in mind that we, we okay. glossed over. But we're going to continue on the uh, the New Jersey City University tour of this uh, of this uh, panel because it certainly is dominated by people who are associated with the school and we're going to go go now to Gail Marquis who works at the school but more importantly Gail was like uh, John Beekman said was on the first ever women's basketball team uh, for the United States in 1976 um, in Montreal which was a great Olympics uh, for the United States. And she was part of the team in 76 that won the silver medal. And I know she's very, very proud of that achievement. And, but I'm going to let her talk a little bit about her basketball career um, growing up and playing at Queens college and then getting a chance to play on the Olympic team. And she's a, a pillar of our community. And that's my friend, Gail Marquis. Gail, take it away. Jim, Jim, thank you so much. It's great to see you. I hope that you and your family are well. Uh, Jim gave me the opportunity one time to uh, speak at his uh, wife's courthouse uh, when it was court day. I really enjoyed that. 
getting the chance to kind of step off of the athletic soapbox, but really uh, still staying on it because there's so much desire, dedication, and discipline in and around athletics. And I was happy to help make make Jim look good. I think your stock went up <laughs> when the family told me because you brought an Olympian to the courthouse. So uh, I'm always ready to do that and help out my uh, friends in the community. But uh, I'd like to thank you, Jim, for remembering me for this panel, as well as my new friend over at the Jersey City Public Library, Yolanda Kehi. We haven't met yet, but Yolanda has been very good and diligent uh, in supporting me to so I can be part of this panel. And of course, New Jersey City University, NJCU, uh, my new home here in Jersey City. I can't believe I've been here for like 30 years or something. I just came here for a long weekend and now I have a home, my second home that I'm here. But um, it's great to be on this panel. Otis Davis and I worked to start the, uh, I think it was the first uh, Olympic uh, Association, the Tri-State Olympians taking in New York, New Jersey and Connecticut Olympians and making our chapter our association. So it's always great to see Otis. And Otis has been a guest at NJCU when we have Olympic days, along with JoJo Starbucks and, and other Olympians, not in Jersey City, but in the state of New Jersey. So great to see Otis as well. And of course, Elena, our new uh, wrestling coach. NJCU has one of the first women's wrestling programs, not well in the state, but also in the country. So. Happy to see Elena too. We kind of been separated because of the pandemic. Uh, but I have enjoyed hearing the stories that came before me. Uh, a little bit of background. Originally, I grew up in Queens, New York, St. Albans, New York. And it's, um, it's, it's very proud and humbling to have such a great, uh, great life that I have. And it all stemmed from athletics. And it's interesting to hear the stories of the 1968 Olympics because that's pretty much when I got involved in the Olympics. Um, no, I was not at the games at all, but uh, I was in the midst of a teacher's strike in New York City. The teachers were on strike. They stayed on strike from, let's say, September till November. But in the middle of that were the Olympic Games, the 1968 Olympic Games in Mexico City. Um, I had always played sports in the, in the street, uh, always played sports in my high school. Uh, but here I was watching high caliber athletes like Wyoming Atias. Uh, win the 100-yard dash in 11-0, and watching a Jimmy Hines win, win the 100-yard dash in a 9-9. In a nine -nine. And then some guy from Jamaica High School, which is the next town over from where I grew up, some guy named Bob Beeman, he up and jumps out the pit. He jumped out the pit and kept going jumping out the pit. Uh, so when I see Bob, he's strictly 29-2. That's his, that's his uh, tag name. And to this day, Bob's Olympic record still stands. Yes, the world record has been broken, but the Olympic record can only be challenged at the Olympic Games, and it's never been broken at the Olympic Games. Unbelievable. It's like being with Mick Jagger or, or, John, or, or Paul McCartney when I hang out with Bob Beeman. He is just that elated. But to see these figures on TV, they didn't have, they didn't have the ambiance. They didn't have the, the uh, charisma that they do now. But for a girl growing up in St. Albans, in this little town here, uh, where I thought I was, was good because I was on the basketball and on the, on the uh, softball and I ran track and I threw a shot, put all these other things, but to see the focus. And these were African-Americans as well. So it, it kind of pulled me in and I remember, how can I run that fast? And, and how can I do some of the things that they did? Um, at the time, because of that strike, I didn't want to go to school anymore. I mean, I'm waiting three months to go to school, to go to class, and there is no school. So I, I told my sister Joan that I wanted to drop out of high school. This is my first year. And she said, you can't do that. Daddy won't let you do that. So, so I stayed in school um, and I got into sports and that seemed to be what carried me forward. Uh, leaving high school, uh, I wasn't recruited for college, to go to a college sports team. And I like to tell people because there were no scholarships for girls, for women's basketball. There were no scholarships for track and field. There were no scholarships for softball. I went to the local Queens College because there were five children in my family. And my father had this budget for each one of us to go to college. And he put all five of us through college. That was my budget 
And it was within that budget I could attend Queens College, who had the best women's basketball team in the area at the time. I had a great coach, Lucille Cavallis. She turns, I think she turns 85 tomorrow. I sent her a card, so we're on good terms. <laughs> She's in Florida. But you know, she was such a demanding coach to the point where I, I didn't like her after a while. But when I would tell my mother that the coach did this, that, and the other, she was like, She's the coach. She told you to do that, you need to do that. So I was kind of stuck with her. And if any one of uh, the players on, on here would know me, I mean, no uh, sports and no coaches, when they tell you to do things, you know, you're just so disciplined that you end up doing them and they really do take you through. So uh, that coach, after my first year, coming off of a great year of, of basketball and sports in high school, I go to college and I play, but I don't get that much playing time. And I'm, I'm a little perturbed. Uh, and the coach sends me, she said, you go to a basketball camp. I had never heard of a basketball camp. I'm a Girl Scout. I've been to Girl Scout camps. I know how to pitch a tent. I know how to roll up a blanket. I know how to tie knots and everything and whittle. I never even heard of basketball camp. But she sent me to this camp in Pennsylvania. And to this day, you know, 20, 30, 40 years later, I'm still a superstar at that camp. That camp taught me the fundamentals of the game. They broke it down. So when I went back to college, I had to play for this crazy lady, Lucille Cavallis, that I signed up for. It started to make sense. The yelling, when she used to yell at me so much, when she used to grab at my shirt, sometimes she would even hit me. I'm mean, not hit me, I mean, foul me on purpose. And I would call a foul. And she said, there's no foul, there's no foul here. This is just workout. And so all of those little stepping stones is what really makes the finished product that you see today. Um, people know my accolades, my stories of being on the Olympic team, but I would be nothing on that Olympic team. I never would have made that Olympic team had I not tried out for the world university teams and the Pan Am teams. And, and the other county teams that I was not selected for. I went to the World University Games on an invitation. I was invited to come try out in Merrillville, Tennessee, maybe two years before the Olympics. And they went down, they, they cut down from maybe 50 or 60 young ladies down to about 15. So I'm thinking I got a good chance to be on the team. They only took six of us, of six of them, and they picked up the others from other schools. So that was pretty dejecting. Uh, so what do I do? I go back to college and take it out on my teammates. I really beat them up the whole junior year. And, and, and then the, the next year I get a chance to try out for the Olympic team. And as I hear the stories of other athletes, you, you have to know that I was wishing for something that didn't exist. There was no women's basketball team my junior year of high, of high school or college. There was no women's uh, barely all American teams at those times. So how do you wish to be on an Olympic team when there is no Olympic team, when there is no women's uh, Olympic team? And maybe, maybe Elena can speak to that as well because she, I think this is the first year they're having women's wrestling. So how do you speak to a dream, a passion, something that you wanna do and see when it doesn't even exist. Uh, but fortunately in 1976, after I had been cut from so many other previous teams, I got a chance because they announced that there was going to be an Olympic team. Um, I had not made the Pan Am games the previous year, so I had to start from scratch. Uh, I think my first tryout was uh, a regional tryout, which occurred at Southern Connecticut State College there were about 150 girls and women there. They put an ad in the newspaper to come try out for the Olympic team. Um, I knew about it, but you know, you, you go into these trials. First of all, you don't want to get hurt by somebody who doesn't know how to play, but they cut down from 150, maybe 130. The woman came out and said, there's so-and-so here, we're taking five. We're taking five of you out of 130. I put the blinders on, you know, I try to tell kids about racehorses. They've never been to the track, so they don't know about the racehorses and the blinders. I just tell them, I put the blinders on. I didn't worry too much left or right. I just knew I had to get through these trials, these regional trials, so I could go to the national trials. I made it through when they cut down from 120 or 130. They kept cutting over three days. And then by Sunday afternoon, two o'clock, 
they got it down to five. They shipped the five of us two weeks later to the national trials for the Olympic games. And that one was against the Pan Am team who had made it before those 12 plus other regional sites. So we're about 50 to 60 young ladies there uh, from high school age to college to post-college. And again, the same tryouts, they cut down from 60, they put you through drills, they put you through the fundamentals. And I tell you all of this because there never would have been a Gail Marquis USA number 11. There never would have been a silver medal around my neck. There wouldn't have been the confidence to go to France, to play pro, to come speak on your show if I hadn't gone through this process. So after those Olympic trials, uh, they cut it down to about 20, 22 on a Friday night, split us up into four teams and put us through, the, put us through all the different uh, drills, all the different full courts. And I guarded some of the best players in the country from uh, Nancy, Nancy Lieberman to a Pat Summit to a Carol Blaze Drowski, one of New Jersey's favorites. And at the end of the day, I held my own I thought I had blown it against Carol Blaze because she seemed to have gone on a terror and just scored at will. I went back to my room and I started packing my clothes to, uh, to leave and go back to Queens. And then I said, well, I'm not gonna go back to Queens because I always keep missing these, these uh, trials and I didn't wanna see my mother at the airport waiting for me, but usually with a big sign to say, we love you you know, you didn't make the team. So everybody in the airport would know. And this is the time before TSA where you could actually go to the gate and meet somebody when they came off the plane. I didn't want to do that. So I said, I'm going to go to, I'm going to go to Portland, Oregon by way of Las Vegas. And I'll go stay with my sister Joan there. And uh, as it turns out, uh, that that evening, that Friday, uh, Nancy Lieberman comes in. They post the, the 12 players in the alternates and they post it up there. And, uh, Nancy Lieberman comes into my room and she says, Gail, me and you. Nancy Lieberman grew up in Far Rockaway High School uh, in Far Rockaway. She comes and said, Gail, me and you, New York, were on the team. Uh, so I cursed her out and I told her to get the F out of my room because I really didn't <laughs> want any of her antics. And then Carol Blazjowski comes in and her face is all red. And she comes in and says, congratulations. And it was only then that I knew I had made this team. And I never worked harder in my life, uh, from the drills, to the listening, to the tenacity, to, to the three-a-day practices that we would have, to we just qualified. We had to qualify for the Olympic team because the previous Pan Am team had not. And just working with my teammates from an Annie Myers to a Nancy Lieberman to a Lucy Harris who scored the very first basket. And I often tell people about our opening ceremonies when we actually entered or, or lined up and entered that Olympic Stadium in Montreal, Canada. And just that we entered and, and all 300 of us, because there's everyone from the gymnasts and the flyweights who were in boxing and gymnastics, all the way up to the boxers and the wrestlers and the men's basketball team and us. And uh, it was one of the glorious moments just being in the Olympic ceremonies. And I like to tell people as I entered and turned and went in that stadium, uh, Queen Elizabeth is there, the Queen of England. She's in a beautiful pink outfit, pillbox hat, a beautiful purse. You know, everything matches with the Queen, the gloves, and she's just waving. They said, don't wave, don't wave. I waved and I took a picture, okay? <laughs> this is before your cell phones. I had a little Instamatic camera, but another glorious moment. And for us to go through the round robin tournament, and I'll tell you, I didn't get much playing time on that Olympic team. So what did I do? I took it out again on my teammates. And I made, I made the Liebermans, the Myers, the, the uh, Julian Brzezinski's, Simpsons. I made them work so hard. I made them look so bad so the coach would put them on the line and they'd have to run some more because they weren't giving me playing time. But that was cool because the last game against Czechoslovakia, uh, when our coach came in and said, if we win, you get a medal. If you don't, it's just a nice kiss on the cheek. And thank you very much. You get to keep the clothes, so to speak. Uh, but that last game we played against Czechoslovakia and uh, we were down a little bit at the half or maybe it was close, but we really pulled it on on the second half and we pulled it out. We beat Czechoslovakia and they said we're going to receive a, a silver medal. 
And I tell you, my, my prayers had always been to make the Olympic team. I never prayed that I would, I would win a medal because again, it was a dream that didn't even exist. Uh, but to have the opening ceremonies, and I sent, um, I sent uh, Mr. Beekman and also Yolanda Kehi, I sent them some photos of me receiving my Olympic medal. And uh, I know people get married, they have children, they do such great things in life. And for me, um, I think of the Olympic experience every single day in my life. Not one day goes by that I do not think of the Olympic experience because it has impacted my life so much. Um, you know, the things I was able to do, I went to Europe to play basketball for three or four years because there was no pro league here. And then when I returned, they had a pro league, I did pro league. Um, I'm able to have a great position with uh, New Jersey City University. I raised money for our community to send our students, to keep our students in, in school with scholarships and endowments and get these other corporations along the Hudson Rivers to be good citizens and again, donate to our students uh, in our community. So my life has just been so enriched by it and so many different facets have touched my life. So I'm very fortunate about it. I continually give back. And uh, like I say, I came to Jersey City on a long weekend and I've been here for 30 years. So I thank you for having me. And I've been a lucky inductee to the Hudson County uh, Hall of Fame. I know Jim and others have seen uh, what I do. I'd also like to thank so many of my family and friends who are in the chat room or on the participants. I put out a blast and said I'll be on and, and they're in, on, the, on the Zoom with us. So I wanna thank them for that as well. So uh, I've gone on long enough. And uh, again, thank you so much for having me. And I'm so proud that I'm able to contribute to the long history of Jersey City. And of course, women's sports and women, women great women in sports uh, uh, in this area. Thank you so much. Thanks, Jim very much, Gail. And uh, just like everybody else, just like Otis and yourself, the the idea that it'll never always have as part of your resume as, as being state's Olympian. And that's something that's 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 got to be a great, great thrill. And I, I imagine Otis feels the same way that uh, that title will never go away. Um, it could be an epitaph. Uh, always the first. Well, always the first. You are. That's right. You were. You were part of that first team. So, so thank you very much, Gail. And uh, uh, I'm not leaving the best for last. But uh, uh, Elena, you are the youngest of the people in the, yes. in the room. <laughs> so Elena Perzikova is uh, the, the new New Jersey City University women's wrestling coach they just started the program um a year and a half ago and unfortunately boom the pandemic hits and they wasn't able to have a competitive team but she's there but before she became to new jersey city university she um was a two-time uh member of the olympic team and uh and she's going to give a little bit of the background of her life and her career and how she ends up uh at New Jersey City University. So Elena, if you can, let's give a little bit of background of how you, first of all, got involved with wrestling. And then second of all, uh, your, you know, now your career, your new career as being the new head coach at New Jersey City University. So Elena Perzikova, thank you very much for having, being here today. And uh, it's, you're, you're up. Awesome, thank you. It's an uh, honor to be here and it's amazing to listen to everybody's story. So um, thanks for having me on Yolanda. Um, so although uh, the pandemic has hit us and affected our season a little bit, um, we actually did still have a successful season at NJCU. We actually had two All-Americans, so it was a very good start to women's wrestling. So, but we'll circle back to that, how I got there. Um, so my roots don't go back uh, in Jersey as far as maybe perhaps some, some of the other stories we've listened to. I've lived in Jersey about five years. Um, backtracking a little bit further. Um, I was actually born in Russia. I came here in 1990. Uh, we came over as refugees fl uh, fleeing the Soviet Union. Um, I grew up in Massachusetts, uh, so I'm kind of from the East Coast. Uh, I came back to Jersey to, to kind of get back to the East Coast vibe. Um, I started wrestling in high school. Uh, my brother got me into it. Uh, I used to think it was WWF, so I I was like a tomboy. I joined it and I was like, this is not <laughs> what I expected it to be, but I ended up really loving the sport. Um, I did track, cross country, football, 
multiple different sports. So I kind of stuck through it. And like Gail said, I never dreamed of becoming an Olympian just because I didn't even know women's wrestling existed on that level. I never knew women's wrestling was in the Olympics, although women's wrestling was in the Olympics the first time in 2004. Um, but um, I wrestled guys uh, in high school, just like many other girls did. Um, it was a little tougher. So, you know, not a lot of girls stuck it out. I was just uh, one of the few. So I'm very thankful to have uh, uh, to see people like Gail, uh, one of the female pioneers in women's sports. So um, when we saw these women growing up, we we're like, wow, like, okay, girls can do this. So um, wrestling is not something I considered uh, doing in college because uh, during that time, there's only five female colleges or five female college teams, and there really wasn't a lot of um, scholarships or anything available. So I was just thinking once I finished uh, wrestling in high school that I was just going to stop. But I went to, I got invited to a junior camp out in Colorado Springs uh, at the Olympic Training Center because I got third at uh, Freestyle Nationals for women's team. So I would, I would compete at two women's competitions every year. Um, but then the rest of the time I competed against guys um, just due to, again, not as many women competing, although that has changed drastically. Um, so I went out there for my first camp and the coach invited me back for a senior camp. So I was like, okay, I must be doing something right. Um, and like, I knew this was an opportunity in life and the person who paid for my flight out there, it was a family friend and they said, they're like, go there and don't come back <laughs> until they force you to come back. Um, just cause you know, my life story, I, you know, I grew up in Massachusetts, like, you know, low income family, nine kids, you grew up on welfare. So it's like, whenever you see that an opportunity like this, you're like, you got to maximize it to its uh, full uh, potential. So once I came there for the senior camp, uh, the coaches asked me if I wanted to move to the Olympic Training Center and train. And I was kind of shocked. So when I moved there, I was like, all right. I'm like, I remember coming into the wrestling room and I'm like, oh my God, there's like bronze, like Olympian, like silver Olympian, gold medalist, all this stuff. And I'm like, oh my God, like, I don't even belong here. Like I'm, I'm a nobody compared to these girls. Um, but they wanted me um, and I was thinking, I was like, oh, okay, I'll probably be here for like two years. I'll probably like, you know, this is a stepping stone in life. Like this will be great on my resume. And then I'll kind of figure out where I want to go in life after. Uh, but little did I know, it was like within two years, I made my first world team and I started making money. I started traveling the world. I'm like, this is fantastic. I'm like, I'm going to continue wrestling. So I started wrestling a little more, a little more. And before I knew it, I was like number one in the USA for 10 years, uh, world champion, two times silver, one time bronze, mm -hmm. two time Olympian. Like, so I had, I had a very long career. Uh, it was very exciting. Um, but, uh, sports is not forever. Uh, there's a, a earlier time limit. There's an earlier retirement on uh, this uh, field. So, and it's, uh, I always like heard about other athletes talking about how it's very hard for athletes to transition into regular life, just because you're literally doing like a career change in like the peak of your life. It's almost like a midlife crisis in a sense. So I was like, I always vowed to myself, I'm like, I will never be that person. I was like, I'm going to transition well. I'm going to find another career. Um, but coaching is not one of those things that I thought, because again, my view on women's sports growing up through the sport was when I uh, was first looking at colleges, there was only five women's teams at that point. Now it's like, I think it's like 50 or above now. So the amount of women's college like teams has drastically changed. Exactly. So um, I moved to Jersey City about five years ago to kind of continue training. My husband's also an athlete. Um, he also a wrestler. Uh, so he's training for the Olympics right now. He didn't make this Olympic team, but he's training for the next one. Um, so we're kind of like trying to find a place where I can go to school, he can train and make everything happen. And I was kind of in Jersey City and I kind of got swooped into this coaching position <laughs> that I didn't really expect. But um, it was a wonderful surprise just because there's so many opportunities now for women in sport. Um, and it's uh, good to see that uh, females can go from uh, competing in sports and yeah, they can go into coaching positions. So uh, that's how I kind of got like, uh, became a coach. It's not something I expected. Um, I chose to go become a chiropractor as well, just because uh, any athletes who've uh, been to a chiropractor, some of you guys might not, you might've missed out, uh, but it's a wonderful profession, I guess, to utilize when you're competing just because your body gets so beat up. So I remember mm -hmm. receiving the chiropractic care and I was like, this is like magic. I was like, I want to do this. I want to work with athletes. So currently that's where I am. I just recently graduated. So, I mean, we're heading into our second season on competition and starting a practice. So 
that's it. <laughs> well, thank you very much, Elena. I appreciate it. Okay. Um, and can you talk a little bit, did you didn't get a chance to compete in the Olympics because there was no women's, uh, no women's wrestling in the Olympics the two times that you were involved? No, nope, there, there, there was women's wrestling. So my first Olympics was a big flop. Um, I went out there and I lost to this girl that I never uh, competed against. There was somebody that it's like, it's kind of dangerous in like one-on-one -on -one sports. If you, if you're going against somebody that you've never competed against, um, just because you don't, you've never felt their style out, and I never competed against this girl. So, um, in wrestling, how it works if you lose, if you lose somewhere in the tournament and that person doesn't make the finals, you're out of the tournament. So, I lost my first match, um, and the girl lost her second one, so it took me out of the tournaments. Um, and so, I was kind of upset of the performance, you know, it wasn't the best that I could be, you know, mm -hmm. um, just because I know I can, I, I've beaten world champs, I am a world champion myself, so I was like highly anticipated to win, but the Olympics are a different animal than the world championships uh, for a lot of athletes for a lot of different reasons. Um, but then in 2016, um, I ended up losing in semifinals by one point, kind of gypped by the ref, but again, it is what it is. So I ended up placing fifth, um, but uh, it was a way better performance. And I walked away from it saying like, you know what, like, the, I guess the beauty of sport is like, if we all competed on the same day at a different time, if there was a different ref, et cetera, et cetera, things turn out differently, you know, but that's sport, you know what I mean? So it's like, like it or not, you know, um, I've, I've always, when I, whenever I mentor younger women or just, or any other athletes, I always tell them like, I've always had the pleasure uh, of winning big and losing big. Uh, you learn a lot from both of those. <laughs> and what I mean by that is um, sometimes when athletes just win, 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 um, they develop like a, a false sense of self. They, um, I've, cause I've seen this, I've lived at the Olympic training center for 10 years. I've interacted with many athletes, watched so many athletes over their lifespan. So um, when you, uh, a lot of athletes base their self-worth based on their medals. And once your athletic career is over, I'm like, there's a lot more to life than sports, even though sports are pretty fantastic and we all agree. Um, but I realize I'm like, cause you can see like how people treat you differently based on the way you win, like the way you perform that year, like the way sponsors treat you. So I was like, I would say I'm like, I developed a very healthy sense of self and like the, my outlook on life, it wasn't based on my ups and it wasn't based on my downs. You know, it wasn't, I didn't consider myself extraordinary and above when I was the world champ, but I also didn't view myself as below, you know, when I was losing. So like, again, that's, it's just sport, you know, and it, I think like if you learn those lessons, I think sports are like a very healthy way to develop very like psychologically healthy human beings, hence why I'm coaching. <laughs> Good. All right. Well, Elena, thank you very much for sharing your story with us all. All right. And now um, I don't think there's any questions from anybody that's online. So I got a list of questions that I'm going to start. Uh, Alan, we're going to start with you talking a little bit about uh, Andy. Um, do you know offhand whether or not there was any talk at all about Andy becoming a decathlete? He was without question considered to be the, the world's fastest human back in the uh in the early 50s, but was there any talk at all of becoming uh, an Olympic athlete or what, I mean, a decathlete, or was it very hard because there were uh, great decathletes from the United States at that time, like we had Bob Mathias and then later on Rayford Johnson. So, uh, you know, Andy had the ability to do uh, eight, nine different events if he had to. Was there any talk at all, you know, mm -hmm of whether or not Andy was, the, was, the, was there talk about Andy becoming a decathlete? That's an excellent question, Jim. Uh, I think he could have really been a tremendous uh, decathlete. Um, the problem was uh, his leg injuries. I think that really, you know, limited him uh, going into the uh, 52 and 56 Olympics. Um, I didn't find any documentation in my records anyway, um, in terms of making him a decathlete, but he was more focused in terms of the, um, of the shorter events like 220 um, and so forth and the relays. Um, but looking in retrospect, um, it's, it's wondering, you were saying things about, and the wonderful panelists were talking about the what ifs on a certain day, a certain time, you know, he would have been possibly one of the greatest um, Catholics of all time. But suffice I, to say, he didn't. And I just remembered there, another decathlete that was a great athlete and uh, 
uh, other people on the panel could probably uh, attest. But the, one of the greatest athletes, and it was a two-time decathlete from the, from the state of New Jersey, was Milt Campbell, who I think is considered to be the all-time greatest athlete in the history of the state of New Jersey. Um, and he was also, think about it, And if Andy was going to be a decathlete, he had to worry about competing with and against Milt Campbell, Bob Mathias, and a young Ray for Johnson. But still, those are three great, great uh, decathletes that he had a battle against. That was not, it wasn't going to be easy, so. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Jim. and I'm glad you brought up Mill Campbell too. Much forgotten, but much um, venerated in many ways in terms of his great abilities. So I'm still looking for documentation, but I think um, Andy Stanfield would have been a great decathlete. So. I agree. I agree. And, and Mill Campbell never, although we lost Mill a couple of years ago, ne never in my eyes. And and what a what a gracious. Uh, kind, considerate young uh, man he was, and uh, and he had a, he's, he's left a great legacy as being, in my mind, the greatest all around athlete to ever come out of the state of New Jersey. No <clears throat> question. People want to throw up Carl Lewis, but Carl Lewis can't get, compare to what Milt Campbell was. And and Otis, I don't know, can you attest to that too as well? Can you do you remember Milt Campbell from Plainfield? And do you do you attest to how great of an athlete he was too as well? Yeah, I wasn't really as familiar as I would like to have been, but I know he was a great athlete, you know. Okay, so now i am now I'm got my questions going. This next question is for you, actually two, okay? First of all, talk, a if you can, talk a little bit about uh, how, first of all, what made you come to move to Jersey City? Um, and to, to just talk a little bit about that. And then second of all, how traumatic was it for you and I know you and I have spoken about this in the past. How, how traumatic was it for you that you lost your medals for a while and then you were able to get reunited with your medals? So first talk about what made you come to Jersey City. And then second of all, um, you know, how traumatic was it for you that you lost your medals for a while? Well, I, when I came from Europe, I came back. Uh, I was at McGuire Air Force Base as a civilian athletic director. And after uh, I wanted to get back in a civilian life, so I wanted to move closer to New York because I feel this is where all the action is. And I moved back and I got here in, in Jersey City and I saw the possibilities and the needs for helping these young adults growing up. And uh, I got involved in these programs and I said, I, I specialize in innovative type approaches to this. I had uh, in the YMCA, I had these little sprints, little short distances by age groups. And if you can imagine this, we ran relays inside and we had uh, arena football, which is only flag football inside. Fortunately, we had no injuries. I had something for the girls because we didn't neglect them. We had the girls running relays. And uh, I, I just really enjoyed the aftermath of, of that. And of course the medals was something that I, I've had problems through the years of some of the people that I, I, I di didn't realize what it meant to be a, a quote celebrity <laughs> because I never got into that stuff, but it changes the, your approach to other people and the way they approach you. And I've had some real problems with some of them, uh, with the medals and even uh, jackets and anything that's got Otis Davis on anything. But I've been fortunate I've recovered that stuff and, and uh, I'm still uh, learning what it means because fame is a double-edged sword. You know, for some people, it, it's a give them reason to approach you for negative reason, but also like the letters I've got, I've got some, I'm getting, I tell you the truth, I'm getting more fan mail now consistently than I ever did. And it's from the United States. Well, I, I got a lot from, from Europe, especially from Germany, because that's the guy I defeated, you know. But I'm getting it right now. I just got one yesterday, another one. And uh, I guess because, well, technology, you know, <laughs> and we, we the, the Rome Olympics was televised, unlike Jesse Owens and some of the other guys, you know. So I'm, I'm enjoying the little celebrity type stuff. It's a double-edged sword. And I, I want to get more and more involved and help people. 
And, and the, 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 the information I get from people, the feedback helps me a lot uh, to know that I'm doing the right thing, okay? Well, thank you, Otis, all right? Uh, this question is for you, Charlie, Chuck, whichever one you prefer. I, I, you know, for me, it's easier to say Charlie, if you don't mind, okay? All right. Um, you said, and it's a great part, and I did speak to your father about it on a several occasions, and he, yes, he did. He won six gold medals in the county championships in, in one year, six, okay? And it, I think it's because of, of that success that the, the NJSIA instituted a rule that you now can only run in four events. You're not allowed to do a six, all right? And um, how, uh, you know, did, you, did dad ever talk to you at all about uh, the idea that he was a, a trendsetter and the fact that that'll never happen again because they've limited the amount of athletes, the amount of events that a track and field athlete can compete in to only four? Well, the way I found out was not from my dad. He was, my father was right next to me. It was John Barbie, Mr. Barbie. He was like, you know, your dad won six. I, I looked at him and said, you know, you're going to tell me this. And I don't talk about stuff like that. I'm like, okay, no, fine. You know? So I said, what happened? <laughs> so he, he tells me, he downplayed it. He said, no, no, no. John Barb was like, no, yeah. he ran six events. He went from one to the next, to the next, to the next, to the next. And I'm like, first question came out my mouth, you know, why didn't you become a decathlete? I said, that's a no brainer. He said, I didn't want to. <laughs> he said, I just didn't want okay. to. He said, I didn't want to because he, don't like lo he didn't like losing, first of all. So he never would say it, but I know he did it. No one does really. But to have him think about it after 68, after he kind of passed your prime and didn't want to do it, it's, like, it's a what if. It's like you're saying, it's a what if. He said, maybe I should try it now, but he couldn't. But I would have definitely did it. I mean, he had immense talent. I mean, I mean, I never believed the baseball story, but a lot of, you know, um, I did. No, but no, I really didn't until there was someone um, from the New York Times that we were at some kind of event. And he said, did you tell your son about the baseball story? And being that's funny, my brother Eric plays baseball. You know, my I have two sons. Um, one they my one son doesn't want to run track because he don't want the pressure. He told me straight up, like, mm -hmm. I don't want I don't want to do this. I don't want to be number. I don't want to be calling, calling your name out. And my other son, he just he like he likes to focus on what he needs to do, and I don't mind that. So he's doing rowing. <laughs> my one son wow. and my other son plays basketball, and he does lacrosse. So, but the one that does basketball and lacrosse, he's gifted running, but I'm just waiting for that to happen. I'm not going to push it. My dad didn't push it on me. As you know, my brother, Eric played baseball. So it, it, it'll come in through your DNA. But anyway, as far as him with this decathlon thing and the, the six medals, it was, he never told, he never told us so someone else told us. I heard a lot of things, uh, right before he passed and after he passed that he would never talk about because I was, to me, he was just dad, you know, he's my friend. He's my best friend and my dad and, and he's my best friend. I mean, so we, we would, he taught me a lot of things as far as coaching one, you know, what to look for, what is he doing wrong? He would quiz me, but he wasn't, I think he got, honestly, I think he got turned off by, by sport. That's what I think. I really do. I mean, it's just, he never would show it or say it, but I know him. So. Last last thing I got for you, Charlie, is that your dad was training uh, at the age of 32, uh, still has not given up the sport at the age of 32, and he was training on a regular basis, what, like you mentioned, with Keith Davis, who is a very good friend of mine, and Larry Ross. And um, they both gave him credit that, that dad pushed them both um, to become – uh, a better, better athletes. And as a matter of fact, both of them, both uh, Keith Davis and Larry Ross just missed being Olympians themselves, but they won the national from Adelphi, from championship Adelphi. at Adelphi. Right. 
and they were part of at one time they held uh, the United States and the world record um, in the four by 400 meter relay. Uh, but um, uh, dad was 32 years old and was considering uh, the chance of being uh, a decathlete because of all the different things that he was doing, but he was 32 years old. And, and, you know, that was just, you know, I'm not going to say that's an old man, but for track and field, that's, that's pushing it a little bit. Now, Otis realizes too, as well, you were what, 26, <laughs> 27, when you went to the, the Olympic trials in 64, how old were you then, Otis? 28 was when I competed in the games, 28. You were 28 years old when you competed in the games in 60? When I won in six years, I'm dating wow, myself. Wow, you were 28 years old. Wow, okay. My, so you, well, went, 30, so you were 32 career. and 64. I'd had a basketball career. I'd been in the military, you know. So it was a real a good experience. I think I was developed enough at the time because <laughs> I, <was laughs> I was a late bloomer. It's a good thing I was because I needed true. all the help I could get against those strong competitors, you know. And you're still a late bloomer today because I'm proud to say that Otis – my math figures it right that you're now 89 years old. Is that correct? Yeah. Yep. So God bless. You're still with us. I don't, know well. I don't normally say my age too loud in front of the ladies, but now I can't cover it up. <laughs> All right. We can't. Well, you, well, you got me. <laughs> I got you. That's it. All right. Real quickly, because I've been told that we got to wrap it up. Uh, but Gail, I wanted to say two things. First of all, you, you didn't mention the fact that for a long time you were also a high school basketball and a high school and college basketball referee, and you did that for a long time, and you were acclaimed doing that as well, okay? But the, my question to you is that and, – and the quote that, that, you, you, that stood out when you just said in your speech was that you were wishing for something that didn't exist. However, now you're on a team that does exist, and it's the United States of America that invented the sport. Was there any pressure at all that you had to worry about representing the United States in being that first Olympic? Um, I won't say that there was immediate pressure, but uh, one of the stories I found out was that first of all, our, our team in 1976 had not qualified for the Olympic games. So they put this team together, but because the USA team had not won the Pan American games, the year before, the Pan American Games, a competition between North and South America, from Canada, Iceland, America, all the way down to the Dominicans, down to Brazil, North and South America. The USA team did not win or did not play, so they didn't qualify for the Olympics. So after they formulated the team, the first thing we had to do was qualify for the Olympic team. So we went through six weeks of training camp once we were all formulated, and, and then we had to go to a competition in Canada. I think it was in Toronto, Canada, probably the wrong city. And we had to play against the likes of Bulgaria, uh, uh, Brazil, um, Cuba, a lot of the South American countries, Poland and others in order to qualify. So, so the, the, uh, the pressure was there, right there for us to qualify first of all. And then once we did qualify, once we won that tournament, we came in first and Bulgaria came in second. Poland, I think was third, I'm not sure, but, but only one and two qualified for the Olympic games. We went to the Olympics and we played against Russia, Bulgaria, the home country, Canada, uh, the likes like that. Uh, but that's where the pressure li uh, lied. And then once we got to the Olympics and we were actually playing, we found out years later that it couldn't be pressure because the US Olympic Committee didn't think that we would be there. We had to stay in Rochester, New York for about a week because the US Olympic Committee did not have a place for us in the Olympic Village. They didn't have uniforms for us in Plattsburgh, New York, which was a staging area before you actually went to Montreal. And again, I tell you all of this, maybe 10 or 20 years after I finished with the Olympics, that's when my coach, Billie Jean Moore, told all of us that. They told us that uh, uh, the men's uh, manager, Bill Wall, who's in the uh, Women's Hall of Fame, Bill Wall, William Wall, he gave Billie Jean, Billie Jean Moore his credit card so that she could get everything she needed for our team, not just uniforms, but so we can have meals and everything. Again, because the USOC didn't think that we would qualify. Now, fast forward, once we qualify, 
and you get in there, they suit you all up. We got our dress blues. We're in the opening ceremonies. We got our schedule. As athletes, you just plow through. Remember those blinders I spoke about? They're for real. And then after that, the, the medals come on, the accolades. But again, our coaches and managers and even our trainer were good to just keep us healthy, to keep us focused, and just to keep us going forward and make sure everything fell in place and made me feel, uh, you know, I mean, I, I got per diem for the first time in my life. We had no per diem at Queens College. You were on your own with your Happy Meals. I got per diem. I was feeling great. So, so they did what they were supposed to do. So the pressure, they were able to mediate the pressure. And I look at the athletes today and we all have pressure. The Simone Biles, the, the Katie Ledeckis, the swimmers, the, the, uh, the men's basketball team, you don't think they have pressure because they have a great history. We had no history in 76. It was just us, a bunch of ragtags. So uh, you, you have to mediate it, you have to manage it. But again, I look at, um, you know, I told you that whole opening story because that's what makes Gail Marquis. Not so much the medal around my neck, but all of those missed opportunities when they never selected me and when I kept coming back. That's what makes me. So, the, so those are the kind of things, those character builders that push you forward. And to this day, uh, having worked on Wall Street, having officiated, I can't, it would be a whole half hour show, Jim, for me to tell about when I used to officiate your games and you never <laughs> sat down and you hollered from one end of the court to the other. That'd be a whole half hour show. But for okay. me, again, to get through those type of life experiences, I draw back on my Olympic experiences. Remember that. All right, and the last thing from for me, <laughs> and I and I have to mention it, and I and, and I couldn't have been that bad to you, Gail, because you never gave me a technical. No, uh, I did, but I did. Uh, yeah, that's true. <laughs> All right, but the um, the one thing I wanted to say is that uh, after you were inducted into the Hudson County Sports Hall of Fame, um, you, I used to have a thing that was called the Hudson County Hall of Fame outreach, where I used to bring the top two student athletes from each high school in the county. And we'd come to a luncheon at the, uh, the building in Lincoln Park. And, uh, and I asked you to be one of the speakers one year. And not only were you a speaker, but you did a really great thing by, by bringing your medal and get, letting the kids see your, your silver medal. Okay. And they touched it and they were so impressed by that. And that was something that I will hold on to forever is just being there and watching these impressionable kids, we must have about 60 kids in the room. They were all impressionable. They did not want to leave that room until they got a chance to touch your medal and put it around their neck and whatever. So it was a very, very impressionable thing. So that, that, I can't, that, I can't thank you enough important. for that. My pleasure. It was great. My all right. Now, um, last thing from Elena. I hear you became a chiropractor. And is your practice in Jersey City? And and let's give it a free plug. If you're, you know, if you're doing a Jersey City, you're, you're a chiropractor in Jersey City. Yes. So I graduated uh, in May. Um, and it's, you know, you, there's a process of uh, applying for your license, getting like your national provider number. There's like a bunch of paperwork you got to get. I'm um, at a point where I'm finishing that up and I want to take a stab at starting my own practice. So I've kind of, um, that's been in the works. So hopefully that's going to open up soon. Um, I'm looking at starting it at the gym. I was doing some personal training at, it's called Base Gym. It's uh, located in downtown Jersey City. Um, so if you guys ever need a chiropractor in your Dan downtown, <laughs> I might be in that area. Um, so hopefully, I mean, it's uh, something that I've never done before, but like Gail says, you know, you always draw from your Olympic experience to uh, apply to other places in life. And a lot of people are like, oh, like you're starting your own business. This is like, you know, it's very difficult. I'm like, well, I've also done a lot of other uh, difficult things in my life. So, you know, um, you don't need to know everything. You just one step at a time and things might turn out better than you, you think they will. So, so yeah, so hopefully uh, base gym, Jersey City. All right, thanks, Elena. All right, now, John, um... John Bickman, uh, I, I noticed that there are questions that are in the chat uh, queue. Do you want me to read the questions and ask the uh, the panelists that these questions? What do you want? What do you want? How do you want to handle it? Well, sure. So I know we're we're already well past the hour and a half mark, and and uh, you know I know what you folks signed up for or not, but uh, I have no problem with us keeping going a little bit longer. They're interesting questions. One of them 
seems to be for you, and they, it says John, but it's about the maybe the Hall of Fame. So you might want to address that. But if yeah, I don't think that's part. I don't think that's part of the uh, the, the panel. Uh, so and that was an interesting conversation, uh, side conversation about the Nike uh, situation. But yeah. um, yeah, well, since I'm here on camera and and talking, I, I'll go back and and read uh, Mandy's uh, questions. Okay. And then uh, and then Mur Muriel's. Uh, I, I don't know if we uh, let let's ask Muriel's first because that then then we can end on a maybe a more positive thing. But uh, Muriel asks, what do the yesterday's Olympians feel about the amount of money involved in today's games uh, and sort of the commercialization aspect of it? So I don't know if any of you want to address that issue. Or... Uh, I'll take a stab at it. The commercialization of it, it it's evolving. It was going to happen anyway. Uh, to what extent? Uh, you, you see the professional athletes, now they're able to take care of themselves. I look at some of the runners who can turn pro. Uh, Otis can attest to that, that we didn't have much money when we were competing. Uh, we had, you know, you wanted, you had to remain an amateur. Uh, uh, so a true amateur, I don't think we could even be teachers in a school. I had one teammate, uh, Pat Summit, Pat Head at the time, she was a teacher at the University of Tennessee and she was not able to be a teacher. She had to back off because she was on the Olympic team because they had very strict rules about amateurism. I think one thing that comes to mind is in 1988 when the USA men's basketball team lost to a bunch of professionals uh, and came back with the bronze, all of a sudden they shift the rules and started to allow athletes to earn more money. And, and moving into the 1996 Olympics, more companies like a Home Depot, like a U, UPS, United Parcel Service, they started to uh, not just pay athletes, but employ them, employ them at Home Depot or United Parcel. And maybe you wouldn't have a whole 40 hour work week, but enough that they could also subsidize you. And now we're at the point where NCAA athletes are actually receiving money for their likeness and all. So it's an evolution. Uh, you talk to someone like a Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, you know, he'll say that when he was with the Milwaukee Bucks, he was earning maybe three million when he made it. And, and as his, his career evolved, he made millions more. So, so sure, I wish I had made money, uh, you know, 20, 30, 40 years ago. I wish I had some zeros on my paycheck, much less a paycheck. So it's an evolution of the game. Um, and, and one thing I will say about it is that I am pleased that more Women are being paid and able to go professional, whether they're in track and field, or now our women in the WNBA are getting a much better salary before they were getting, no offense, a teacher's salary. So, you know, that's limited and they were encouraged to go work another job. Um, I'm happy that more athletes are being paid so that they can continue in their sport and train and dedicate to their body and their profession. After they're done playing, if they can parlay that into something, whether it's a coaching position, a teaching position, marketing, again, um, you know, using their education, their expertise, I'm happy that they could do that. And you have a uh, book in the works that will really explain a lot of that. I had some real problems because of the coaches were getting the money and we were doing the running and uh, it was, it was, a bad situation, but I'm glad to say that if you have the talent nowadays, you should be compensated for it. Everybody but the talented person in my day was getting compensated for it, but I'll thoroughly explain all the details of that. It's not, it, it was not a good, happy thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm glad I survived it. I consider myself a survivor because I had my college degree and I, did my profession and, and I'm still here now and I'm thriving and I feel good about it. I'm glad I can finally see someone making progress in that area. There you go. Well, they got to talk about that under the table money they used uh -huh. to get right before me. If you wear my shoe, you get this money. If you, if you place, you get, you get levels. That's what I understood. That's what people, um, they used to all talk about that, how much under the table money they would get. Puma would do it, Adidas would do it. So it was straight cash. Well, when you think about that, Chuck, why did they do it? They did it because the athlete needed Survival. money. 
You know, I mean, right. I didn't have Survival. a premium. I would have just like to have lunch or dinner or maybe sometimes even car fare or gas money. So uh, just just those under the tables because those uh, 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 shoe companies, they knew that they, they the athletes needed subsidy. They needed something. And uh, now that the NCAA is being called out on the table and being, you know, the NCAA had more than enough years, decades to do the right thing by their, the scholar athlete. Uh, it was always, they didn't want to blemish the scholar athlete, but there were too many people in high places making money off of athletes, male and females. That, that that's where this comes now that they are able to sign for the likeness because you were exploiting them for many years. Athletes were being exploited for many years. I, John, that, that could I be another half hour. Uh, uh, Jim, that could be another half hour. <laughs> yeah, I think I think this this panel yeah, could, could uh, easily go uh, go on. I know I'm I'm fascinated just to listen, but uh, that's uh, not not the not the world we have right to, uh, today. So, but there are a couple of questions that Mandy asked a, a little while back that I do want to get to. They're very sort of specific, so uh, maybe we can be a little brief. But she wanted to ask Gail. Uh, Women's three by three basketball is taking place for the first time this year. And uh, many wanted to know what your thoughts on that form in the Olympics uh, and how it compares to bring your experience of bringing a new sport to the Olympics, I guess. Right. They have three by three by three or three on three basketball. And if any of us, I mean, we're all from Jersey city, we're urban players. Very rarely do you have a five on five full court in the park. Yeah. We, we honed our skills on three on three. So, uh, <laughs> I'm happy to see that it's broken into the Olympic Games and it's fast paced. You got to kick it out past the three point line to reset all of these things we, we did already. So I'm happy to see it because more players can get involved with playing my sport. So so bottom line, uh, it highlights maybe the outside shooter, the rebounder, the quick in and out. Don't call or call your own files. So I'm happy to see three on three make its debut in the Olympic Games this year. Interesting. So more like a more like street ball, sure. Uh, and then you wanted to ask Otis, uh, what do you think of the mixed relays? And uh, uh, who would you have liked to run with on a relay if mixed relays were in the Olympics when you were? Well, obviously, it's a good idea. Wilma Rudolph would be wow. one of the ones that I would really like because as a matter of fact, I'd like to have two or three of her on there and then I'd be the other person that'll be mixing it up. But uh, anything they can do to make the games more attractive and adding some of these sports adds to it because, hey, we got guys playing uh, what I call tiddlywinks now <laughs> and anything that's competitive, the public is interested in it. And I'm glad uh, to see that happening because we have people with talent in almost everything. And why not display it and let people enjoy it? Because I'm all for the entertainment end of it. And I'm a big fan of all of it. I, I watch all of it as much as I can. And I can understand that because we're all competitors. And why don't we take advantage of it? Mm -hmm. And why don't we get compensated for it? <laughs> uh -huh. And, and, and you know, also to speak to that, to see men and women competing together, it, it's taken a while, but many men are allies of women in women's sports. You know, you go to the park now, it's not unusual to see girls and boys playing together in pickup games. It's not unusual. Elena had to compete against boys so she could, you know, extend her wrestling career. So why not incorporate it because they're used to it now. Boys and girls are used to competing together and against each other, and it just lifts the sport. So you know, I was happy to see it this year as well. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, we're uh, we're. Uh, I'm sorry. Did you want to say something? Yeah, I just wanted to ask them all one real quick, and if they can just keep it to a real quick answer. How much do you have you been watching the Olympics so far? And um, you know, is there been anything that st has stood out in your mind about watching the Olympics as we've seen so far? I'll say one thing. A, 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 there's no crowd. There's nobody cheering anybody on. That has a great effect on people. Yeah, I've noticed that it has a, a deeply, it, it's almost like they're out of sync. They can hear themselves think. 
So therefore the crowd is not diverting their attention. So they need a crowd there to, to actually give them that little extra push. Mm -hmm. And that's in every event, swimming, gymnastics, especially because they can hear their own teammates up in the, up in the middle rows. Mm -hmm. So I think the crowd is a big, big, big problem. Mm -hmm. okay. Anybody else watching that, uh, you know, any special interest at all in the Olympics so far? Uh, I, I, have, I haven't I have been watching, been watching I haven't been watching Reese uh yet um but it's I feel like such a different Olympics um I feel like with the whole COVID situation like yeah like uh not having um the fans there uh I feel like from what I see I feel like athletes are just kind of like not at their top of their game and you can just see it everybody's handled COVID year very differently you know with all the different life stressors that have happened on uh, this past year so it's just interesting to see how athletes have handled it. And I think it's just something that athletes never expected to handle. Uh, but wrestling starts today, so I'm definitely going to watch. <laughs> yeah. And Elaine, I just got to say that um, you're, you, you know, you have no accent whatsoever for somebody who was born in Russia. Thank God. I mean, you really speak English very, very well. And uh, you. you would never think that you were born in Russia and, and, and arrived here, even though you were young. You still had to learn how to speak English, and uh, you've done a very, very good yes. job. Uh, in, the key, in the terms key, of the key is I actually didn't learn. I didn't learn English till I was like seven. But I think the key is if you don't want an accent, you got to learn the uh, you got to learn the language before eleven. So if you want your kids to be like bilingual or anything and speak real, like without an accent, if that's like something you care about, like uh, it's uh, before eleven. I think is the cutoff. You can do it later, but it just becomes a lot more difficult. So. Okay. The last thing I'd like to say, uh, the only thing is that I feel sorry for the disappointments of those athletes who have, because of the pandemic and, and the threat that we have now, that uh, could not participate and could not be at their best. And uh, I'm just glad I didn't have to go through that. Mm -hmm. You have enough problems just facing your competitors about <laughs> all this stuff yeah. and distractions. And I just feel so sorry for them. And that's about all I have to say about it. Thank you. And, and oh, that's you know, a great I'll point. Oh, I, go ahead, Gail. I'm sorry. I was listening to one of the commentators yesterday, and he was saying, um, to Chuck's point, there are nobody in the crowd, and they I think they had their first world record was set yesterday by one of the swimmers. And that was the first world record. We've been watching swimming for five days. Uh, yesterday, I was watching track and field. I think it was the 400 hurdles, and the gun went off to start. And then you could hear an echo, echo. And, echo. and and one yeah, of the one of the runners thought. stopped, and then the one next to her stopped. Meanwhile, the three or four up in the in the lead, they kept running. So, like the gun is bouncing off of the emptiness of an arena that's supposed to hold sixty or seventy thousand. So, God yeah. bless them. One, I'm glad they started the Olympics. Mm -hmm. We have to learn how to live with COVID. I'm glad they didn't cancel them to 2022. Because guess what? We're going to have COVID next year too. And it's, and it's not going to be any different. So God bless them. And I respect the people like Simone Biles and the others who have to take a step back. You are number one. Your mental health, your psych is your most important. It's up to you. I can't judge, you know, your psych. You know, you're, you're in charge of that. So it, it's yep. tough enough, like Otis said, that you got to go through this COVID nonsense. And even some of them get there and they find out that they're COVID positive. So you can't compete. And it's, it's just, I'm just glad the games are able to go forward. And I am enjoying everything. I learned about my mountain biking, surfing, <laughs> and skateboarding. Not yeah, that I would do, it. not that I would do any of those because I have to go to work <laughs> tomorrow or Monday, but I applaud those young people that can do that. I had no idea that skateboarding was an Olympic event until just the other day. I was like stunned. I said, wait a minute, that's an event? All right, but, but. One thing I wanted to ask real quick is that how much do you think having uh, these athletes train for four years and they all in training since 2016, the last Olympics in 2016, then all of a sudden the Olympics get canceled last year and now they have to train for another year. And how much do you think that, that training that extra year either hurt or in some cases like the young girl, from Alaska who won the gold medal 
and she was 17 years old, she would have not have been able to compete in this in in the Olympics yeah. if it was held last year. So vice versa. I mean, has it helped some athletes or hurt others? What is, what do you think about the uh, you know having I, the, I uh, the Olympics postponed? I, th I think it's both. I've heard stories from both. Like I know there are some girls that were looking to retire, like specifically in wrestling, and I'm sure it's in other sports too. Uh, especially like, for example, like I competed in my second Olympics when I was almost 30, you know? So if I had to train for another year and a half, like at your higher age, age range, when you're an athlete, like a year and a half makes a big difference, you know? So if you were planning on like stopping competing, some women want to have kids, some people are starting school, whatever it is, you know, like, uh, people have to put their life on hold due to this, especially on the high, like on the older age, uh, end range of the athletes, but the younger athletes, yeah, some people that maybe would have been in the junior category, snuck into the senior category, so all of a sudden it throws somebody maybe who's about to retire off, so it's like, not only is like your health and um, like mental well-being like um, kind of tested during this time, but so is like your life timeline. So it's been very interesting to watch how different athletes handle it. So like I said, it's it's not been easy, and every athlete's journey during this time has been a little different, just because they face different challenges. Mm -hmm. so. Well, I I just thought that this was so much fun to be a part of. And John, I'll turn it over to you to, that you could, uh, you know, wish the farewells. All right. Thanks, Jim. Yeah, uh, it has been a, a great program. Uh, and I, I really want to thank my colleague, Yolanda Cahey. Uh, she really researched and put this together. You know, she asked me to be the face of it in the, in the meeting, but this is really her program and I have to give credit to her and mm -hmm. definitely want to thank you, Jim, for stepping up to, to help moderate and lead the discussion. But uh, first and foremost, of course, uh, to all the panelists here for taking the time to share your stories and uh, uh, I, I really got a lot out of it. So uh, thank you all. Thank you. Thanks thank, for having thank me. you guys. Good, to, good to see you all. Stay be safe. Be safe. And everyone. I hope I hope we see everybody uh, in person real soon because it's yeah, been way too exactly. long. Exactly. Exactly. Thank you very much. Take care. Take care, Otis. Great to see Otis, you. Otis, take care of yourself, buddy. Be safe. Take care. Be safe.